It's what happens. We're getting near the end. Uh, so in this, uh, in this section, this is a, a snippet of a quite a, a lengthy uh, seminar that I do. In fact, it's uh, two days. So, you know, we're not going to put a two-day seminar into, you know, a one-hour presentation. So the goal of this is what I'm going to try and outlay to lay out if this thing works. <laughs> is to create an understanding of what I mentioned yesterday and again this morning and what has been mentioned in a variety of ways. It, it's, it's not a different way of looking at what Kimchi talked about for terrain, but it's it truly what I believe uh, we all have that's underlying and it ultimately directs who we, who we are, who we become when we pile on all these things that we have uh, around. And, so my bias as far as when, when is somebody cured, uh, it's when their terrain is in balance on all levels. Because at that point, they're able to maintain whatever comes at them in life and still maintain uh, a relatively high level of awareness and wellness. <clears throat> so these are the three components that we're going to uh, briefly touch on. Uh, miasm, temperament, and constitution. They're just words uh, for the most part uh, for what you have at this point. but. The goal is, as I go through and hit literally just a few snippets of each of these areas, you'll, you'll start to identify yourself as being which of those, because you all have, you, in, you uh, all have all inherited these things. You've all inherited a specific miasm from your grandparents and great-grandparents and parents, and you've all inherited a temperament, and you've all inherited a constitution. Uh, that those are all givens, and that's what you come into this life with, <laughs> generally. And it's important to understand more than the name of the disease. Because when you understand an individual's terrain, the most important thing that allows us to do is to predict the prognosis of whatever it is that the problem is. So, you know, if I have somebody with stage four cancer, let's say, the, depending on what the balance of their terrain is, you know, my treatment plan may be to say, I think you should go to Hawaii and sit on the beach. Because that's really the best thing that you can do for yourself. Because there ain't nothing that's going to fix this because of just the way that the cards have all lined up. But then there's other people that say, oh, there's lots of things that you should do for yourself. So it's, not a, it's, it's about trying to create an understanding of that. I showed you this picture yesterday. So, you know, these, this is where medicine tends to want to function and basically looking at an individual branch or a leaf uh, and don't pay a whole lot of attention to really what's going on underneath. And it, when, we, when we're doing, you know, trees and flowers and things, it's really what's in the soil, what are we putting in the soil, how much water is in the soil, what are all the underlying components that will facilitate, you know, a healthy tree uh, above the ground uh, generally. I love this slide. <laughs> so, you know, this is my belief. This is so, somebody asked me about, you know, vaccines. I said, well, you, is this what you want to do? This is what germs are all about. Or we can forget about germs or we can just clean the tank. So let's clean the tank and not worry about the bugs. Because it, long ago we figured out it's not about the bugs. I'm not a believer in the germ theory. I believe uh, bugs have the ability of making people ill, and I believe that there are some bugs that are so virulent that no matter how strong you are, you will get ill. It's true. Uh, we know that the, uh, the disease, the infectious disease that most people die of in the world is what? Malaria. We don't have it in this country, so we don't talk about it very much. But yet malaria is an infectious disease is the most common condition. So I have actually a patient from Nigeria, a little 11-year-old boy who has uh, leukemia. <clears throat> and he's finally been allowed to go back to back home. And he was sick a couple weeks ago and, and they ran malaria tests and I never, and it's like, and she says, well, every time you have a fever in Nigeria, that's the first test they run. Because they just assume you have malaria. And then they give you whatever they give you. And, and many patients here will have had malaria multiple times. And they don't think any of that. It says, oh, I got malaria. It's like, okay, really? 
Uh, so we, I've talked about this, and so I'm going to talk about this one box over here, and this is what we call the pre-birth uh, component. This is your inherited component, and once you're in this world, uh, you lay on all these things, or our patients lay all these things on, and they all get piled on top of this. And depending on which of these triggers lay on which of these miasms will determine what happens to you. In other words, it's predetermined. I don't believe in accidents. <clears throat> you know, I don't believe accidents happen. It's because of this. This is what determines. If people say, well, I've, I've sprained my ankle 10 times. Well, that's not a, those weren't accidents. There's a reason that that happened. It's a predisposition based on your under, what, what you were handed uh, by, your, uh, by your parents, <clears throat> generally. So I mentioned Dr. Gano yesterday. The disease is only the consequence of poor physiology, which, which of course is what our whole organization is about. Understanding physiology and understanding biochemistry uh, will go a long way in understanding. That's why I don't really believe that there's such thing as pathology. It's just adaptive physiology. If, you know, pathology is something that's been made up by medicine. It said, well, I did, did, I took out this, the doctor took out this diseased organ. I said, well, why was it diseased? Well, it doesn't matter, the surgeon took it out. The, when you have adaptive physiology, and when I was still teaching in Portland, for years I tried to get them to change the name of the course. Don't call the course pathology. Call the course adaptive physiology so people will understand that the reason, only reason those things happen is because there's something wrong with your physiology. That's what ultimately we're trying to bioregulate. We're trying to biologically correct that component for what's going on. <clears throat> the understanding of the serves as a broader understanding of how healing occurs and illness develops. That's really the, and you know, I, especially the, the lay people here, it's not necessarily for you to take home, I'll, I'll understand that, but when people have an understanding, this isn't about, you don't blame, it's not the patient's fault that something happens to them. People say, oh, you're, you're, you're saying that you know, they cause this because they eat the wrong food. They eat the wrong food because their terrain is out of balance. They, there's nothing they can do about that. When their terrain is in balance, they'll know exactly the right food to eat because it's already been determined. So the best diet for everybody when you're in balance is your temperament diet. You'll know exactly what to eat because those are exactly the foods that your body knows how to tolerate. And it's already been determined. But unfortunately, the way society and what we feed babies and the things I talked about yesterday has a huge impact on that, as does the medical system. Vaccines is not a natural law. There's nowhere in any society they started vaccinating people. It, it's the first thing that breaks a natural law. So if a baby is born in the hospital and is vaccinated, they've already, they're already breaking a natural law. And already we're going down the wrong path is very unfortunate, but it is a reality of where people are. So we have these three areas that are very much interconnected. The goal eventually, uh, as we've said over and over, the greatest challenge that patients have is they think, well, why can't it happen like yesterday? All this stuff takes time. I believe uh, health is not a 12-week program. It's a lifelong journey. And you always have to constantly be working on your lifelong journey in order to get there. Our goal is to get it stabilized. Uh, and, and once we get there and these things remain stabilized, then it's a lot easier to understand things. So just as a brief summary, what is miasm? What is your individual miasm? For all intents and purposes, <clears throat> I'll say for simplicity, it's how your body has learned to eliminate. It's, it's the, Immune system, I'll use that word, but as you'll see, some of you are great eliminators, some of you lousy eliminators, some of you eliminate, but you do it really poorly. Then we have temperament. Temperament is a word you may have heard, you probably not have, may not have heard the word miasm. Uh, temperament is, because temperament, as we'll see, goes back uh, 2,400 years to Hippocrates. A temperament pretty much determined uh, what you did as an occupation pretty much determine who you decided to marry, pretty much determine whether you want to exercise in the morning or in the evening, and why you feel better doing it when you do it. These, these are almost like everyday things that happens, it's, and it's predetermined by your temperament. 
And then constitution, for those of you who studied homeopathy, there's, we call it constitutional homeopathy. That's not really what I'm going to refer to here, although homeopathy is certainly a part of this. <coughs> constitutional, constitution is, is to some degree, this is the genetic part. It says this is how tall you're going to be, this is what the color of your skin is, the color of what your hair is going to be, it's how big your bones are going to be, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> uh, you know, Dr. Gano basically, you know, how do you determine somebody's constitutional remedy? Well, in my system, there's only seven of them, not 3,000 homeopathic remedies that are out there in existence. There are seven constitutional remedies, and they're determined by what, he, by the, what Dr. Gano described as the doors of life. Life, death, money, illness, sex, power, spirituality, meeting, encounter, and love, which is, uh, which is a predetermined uh, reaction that w we end up having. And, you know, the typical one is, is the money here. And as, we, as you now know, there's people who win tens of millions of dollars in lotteries and things. And if, you were to, if, you, if I was to have you write down and say, if you were to win $100 million, write down what you're going to do with it and seal the envelope. And then somehow you magically won $100 million. Most people will not do what's in the envelope. They thought that that's, I'll give it to charity, I'll do this, I'll quit my job, and da da da. Most people who have won vast sums of money wish they had never won the money because it wasn't their true constitution. Because what they thought they were going to do is what was thinking, but it's not what their constitution told them that was really going to happen to them. <clears throat> so why is it important to understand? Because it tells us how the patient defends themselves, which is a critical thing. How are you going how, when you're exposed to something that's not you, meaning something that's not self. What does your body do with that information? How does the body attempt to deal with it? And the reason it's important to us as physicians, because it allows us to understand why some people who get bitten by a tick that happens to have Lyme don't get Lyme, and why some people getting bitten by a tick do get Lyme. It's the same bug, but why doesn't everybody get sick? It's based on your miasm. And if you're unfortunate enough to pick the wrong parents, and your miasm doesn't eliminate, you have to work harder to, to, in order to eliminate. Doesn't mean it's like, well, I'm destined to get sick. No, it means you have to work harder. It also allows us to determine their prognosis. What's the likelihood that where is this condition going to go? <clears throat> it allows us to recognize whether or not somebody will aggravate. So depending on the individual's miasm, you go a lot, if they're a poor eliminator, you have to go a lot slower. It takes a lot longer to get there. We've talked about taking out amalgams. You know, you heard this morning, you shouldn't only take out two at a time. Maybe you should only take out one at a time if you're a lousy eliminator and spread them out. You should never schedule dental appointments on the same day because you need your immune system to be adjusting to this type of thing. Say, well, I'm off on Wednesday, so I'll come on Wednesday. No, you won't. One week could be a Wednesday. Some other week, you got two weeks later, it should be a Monday. You should never schedule the same day of the week because our body always works in cycles and you don't want to be caught in a cycle where you're at your lowest ebb of how the body will, will efficiently eliminate things. <clears throat> So we do get an idea of understanding the history. Um, and it, it also gives us a sense when we're taking the history of looking at what is their tendency. And you're going to see this when, when we go through some of this. So we can understand the disease, but we don't understand the person. <clears throat> so we, I don't like to think of this disease equals this miasm. All diseases can fit into any miasm. It's what, so we don't correlate the diseases to, to the individual miasms, although sometimes it seems to work. But you know, for somebody who has hormone issues, of which a lot of our patients do, uh, if you have problems, just say this, if you grew up as you were growing up, and when you would get sick, your problems were all above your collarbone, especially for the women. So you had sore throats, chronic ear problems, sinus problems, eye problems, etc. And now as an adult woman, your issues are below your pelvis, meaning your periods didn't start well, you have a lot of cramping, uh, you have endometriosis, there's fertility, you have fibroids, you have ovarian cysts. You are, you, and 80% of women are this miasm, which is psychosis, which is the, which is that, oh, boy, I really jumped ahead, it's this one. 
because it means you don't eliminate. You, your, your body is just incapable of efficiently eliminating it unless you work really hard at it. And so therefore, if you take the uterus out, where does the toxicity go? It has to go to another organ. So all you're doing is you're just moving it from one organ to another until eventually you say, can't they get any more organs out? Or now I have this, this uh, terrible disease. So we have to do something about it before we get to that point. So we know that patients that progressively ultimately get clogged up. We've talked about the importance of the liver. The liver is the decider. Self, non-self is really what the function of, of the liver becomes. <clears throat> now, you inherit miasms, but unfortunately you also acquire them. So you're going to have two miasms. You're going to have the one that you got from your parents, and depending on the choices that you make, you can uh, develop them. <clears throat> I'll give an example of that uh, when we get into this. <clears throat> Each person has traits of one or more, but usually one predominates. It's not like, oh, this person is only this. Many cancer patients have three all at once. Autoimmune disease usually have three, with one of them that predominates, and depending on which one is predominating is the nature of the type of autoimmune disease you're going to ultimately getting. And it can change over time. <clears throat> so the, the goal is we have to deal with the one that's predominant at the time we see the patient. <clears throat> Hahnemann, you'll remember, uh, basically was around in the 1822, early 1800s. Uh, and through the 1800s was also the era when Pasteur was around. And what did Pasteur do? Germ theory, the whole idea of pasteurization. It was also the idea of Koch and Koch's postulates. It was a whole idea that, you know, what, he, what, what Hahnemann found is so-called the founder of homeopathy. People would get sick, he would give a remedy, they get better, but then they get sick again. He said, when the hell do they get sick again? I don't know why they're getting sick again. He postulated it was probably some type of a bug. So he postulated this idea of miasm that maybe it was somehow related to germs. So as a result of that, you know, he said that Sora was, or it was translated as supposedly scabies, but the reality is, I don't think it was, it was more related to candida. Candida's been around forever. <clears throat> Uh, psychosis is more related to GC and HPV, more likely HPV and syphilis is the same as syphilis. And then after Hahnemann came the, the naming of two more miasms, the tuberculinic and the cancer miasm. Tuberculinic uh, was coined uh, by, <coughs> by Vanya, who was a homeopath. And in the 1940s, two British homeopaths coined this one. And because you may have a cancer miasm doesn't mean you get cancer. It's just specific traits. And the two homeopaths uh, coined this particular miasm based on the fact that they were treating women who had both had breast cancer but were unknown to each other. And, and the, these two physicians looked at their children with individual traits and said, oh, these kids were born of a mother who both had, who had cancer. <clears throat> and this is the traits that they basically uh, developed. This is, this is an Australian homeopath who basically laid it out this way. Uh, so somewhere on there is you, you are uh, one of those four mostly cancer we can put in there, but the, real, the reality is you're probably one of the four. People think miasm is something that's bad. <clears throat> it's not. Every single cell in your body goes through the first three miasmatic uh, expressions. <clears throat> uh, Sora is representing the connection to Earth, and it's all about survival. This is what we call the mother miasm. It's the miasm that we all started from because survival, as we'll see, and you know, the, for those of you who know homeopathy, <clears throat> the, when you look at people's soric homeopathic remedies, you'll always see that they're always worried about they're too hot or too cold. Do I have enough food? Is it, is it, what's the weather like? Do I have enough water, et cetera? Everything that they do is about survival and they eliminate, as we'll see. Psychosis is the spring and summer where things are growing. That's what happens in this for these people. They grow things. So they, they grow f fibroids and they grow uterus and they grow ovarian cysts and they grow breast cysts and they grow large tonsils and et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and then uh, syphilitic, which is the, the time of year we're moving into in the fall when everything sort of dies down. And every cell in your body goes through those three stages and they always do. So those are all natural things. And then the things that are not natural are the last two, which is the tuberculinism and the cancer. <coughs> and 
and tuberculosis, uh, as you know, uh, in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, affected 25% of the European population. And because it actually changed expression, people tried to get that because for artists it was, it was the, the most exciting one they should be. So if, if health was simply a matter of doing nature's laws, <coughs> we wouldn't have to do anything else. But unfortunately it's not. And it's not now because these miasms are, we come in and they're out of balance. You know, if, <coughs> excuse me. It may take years to get these things in balance, and if it takes years, it takes years. It's what it is. <coughs> um, you can't change it. Once you have it, you got it. And, but we can certainly even it out, which makes your life a lot easier. <coughs> so these are the four main ones I'm going to talk about. The, uh, so SORC people, so make the assumption that when you're exposed to something, something's going to happen to it. So if you are of a SORC miasm, when you get sick, you're going to express it to the outside. So these are the people who get a rapid high fever. These are the people who get rashes. These are the people who get violent diarrhea. These are the people who have a really wicked asthma attack, so much that it may kill them. And in other words, they have a rapid, fast reaction because the body is expressing it to the outside. And if it doesn't kill you, you recover and you recover quickly. The next one, uh, the psychotic, it, it doesn't. It's unable, it doesn't have enough vitality to push it out of the body. So it pushes some of it out of the body, so you only get a little fever. You don't get 103, 104, you only go 99. It can, never goes higher than 99. <clears throat> and so the body says, well, I don't know what to do with all this non-self. I'm gonna just hold on to it, but where am I gonna put it? So it compartmentalizes it. So it, your uric acid goes up, your cholesterol goes up, you got a fibroid, you got a breast cyst, you got a heel spur, you know, you grow something because that's where it puts it. And if you start removing it, it'll just go somewhere else. That's why removing a uterus and a woman is a problem because it's going somewhere else. And it has to go somewhere else and then you just have another condition on top of it. Uh, the loetic or syphilitic uh, miasm is a, is a, so this one is a good eliminator. This one's a poor eliminator. The loetic is, a, is an eliminator, but they do it very poorly because they self-destruct themselves. <clears throat> so they try and get their, their non-self out. So these are the people that would get like an ulcer and it would like literally open up and, start, and they'd start bleeding and they, it's like, well, they're getting rid of their discharge, but you pay a huge price in order to, for that to happen. So they eliminate, but they do it with great destruction. And then the tuberculinics, they don't do anything. They just get weaker and weaker and weaker. They have no ability to eliminate. Their immune system doesn't react. So these people will eventually start recruiting their entire endocrine system because their endocrine system says, well, your immune system doesn't work. Let's try somewhere else to get you better. So we have these four miasms that you are one of those. One of those belongs to you. That, that, Dr. Gannot tried to convince me of that, but I do not believe that because I've never seen that hat true. Because every time the person gets sick, they always express it whatever their miasm is. So, I, so he would say you would try to move to Sora, but that's not the goal. The goal is just to get in balance. So we'll talk about Sora. So these are the people who have a reaction that is sort of exaggeration of a normal physiologic response. So, you know, we should have a temperature, 98.6. But they're, they're, they got a hundred, so this is the kid who goes to bed, he's totally normal, two hours later they're 105. And you know, so oh, you need to get him belladonna. Well, don't give him belladonna, just put him in the bathtub. Let's not try to treat them, let's let the body try and do what it needs to do. Yeah, you gotta be up all night, stick him in the bathtub, two hours later it's 105 again. Take him out, put him back in the, so you'll do that for 24 hours and you've done the best thing you could ever do for their immune system. Because that's, the fever is the best way to build your immune system. And how often should a kid get sick in the first two or three years? How often per year should a kid get sick? A baby. Four to six times. A baby should be getting sick. That's the only way they build their immune system. But what's, why is that a problem in our society? Because they want to stick Tylenol in them and stop it. No, you've got you to just work with them. 
And you know, people say, well, what if I get a febrile seizure? I said, great, you're gonna, have, you're gonna improve the intelligence of the kid. People who have had febrile seizures have a higher level of IQ. I said, you're gonna have a smart kid, bring him on. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. It looks terrible, and if you're the parent, you freak out as the kid is seizing. But unfortunately, they get then told, oh, I'll never let the kid have a fever. So the parents become paranoid every night to go and measure the kid's temperature. I said, let the kid have a temperature. It's the best thing they can do for themselves. <clears throat> so the, uh, whatever is foreign to this person then gets eliminated through normal among trees. In other words, they get diarrhea, they get skin rashes, they, their urinary system, it's like they're peeing constantly. Those are all good things. That's how they're supposed to be able to eliminate. <laughs> So they're in fact, they can overreact to the point that they could have diarrhea so bad they could become dehydrated if it's a little baby. So you have, to be, you have to be careful. I mean, you can't let a baby have chronic diarrhea and tell you we're not gonna stop that. But you do have to hydrate them. And if that means an IV, you do them an IV. If that means you do a, you know, you put fluid through their colon, you put it in their colon, however. <laughs> so the, uh, what we never want to do is to stop a rash. You never want to suppress a rash because it is the, it's the natural expression no matter which miasm it is because it's only an indication that something is coming from something deeper. The reaction is usually quick. They get over things really well and they feel better after they get sick. That's, that's all good things. So people say, oh, I, wish, I hope I'm that. <laughs> and so for some of you, will you'll be it. They tend to get most of their problems within the skin and nervous system in general, and itching is quite characteristic. You know, in homeopathy, we say, oh, sulfur's a typical remedy. They get red and hot, and they don't like the sun, and you know, they, their rashes get really itchy, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> the other one that comes with this is this internal restlessness. So they have a lot of anxiety. They worry about everybody. They worry about their mother getting sick and they're three years old. You know, they, they worry about everybody else. So the, and this, they just build this constantly inside them. This is typical of this type of a, of a person. <clears throat> and you look at the foods that they crave, milk, eggs, cream, fatty foods, meat, which, which are, you know, disturbed if they eat too much of those types of things. And they're worse usually in noon, around noon. These are very typical characteristics of these people. <clears throat> Uh, if you get vesicles, so in other words, you get a, a rash that sometimes it has dishydrotic eczema or you know, some type of condition, and you put something on there, this is the one you run into danger of creating seizures. So when you treat the seizures, the vesicles come back. So you, don't, you never try and stop these types of, of things. The, these things are obviously have been transmitted and will continually be, so this is the original miasm going back, we're, we'll assume, 200,000 years. This is where we started from, because all the, all, the, all the humanoids at that point were just interested in survival. They do feel better when they have a discharge. They have a, their, their sweat is, has an odor. They don't like to exercise. So some people don't like to exercise, but I'll use the word. You just need to move. You don't need to exercise, you just move. And these people don't like to exercise. <clears throat> they have problems assimilating minerals. They prefer movies that are tear jerkers, family movies, dramatic comedies, and Disney and animal films. Paralyzed by fear, and they get hives because it comes out on the skin. And it's like, why do you like those? It's because it's already been predetermined. It's a predetermined thing that happens. It's like, no, I just like those. Well, that's because you're this particular uh, miasm. <clears throat> the, and these are some of the typical presentations that you'll see in people who are of this particular uh, miasm. Uh, psychosis is the next one. <clears throat> it, it's when the person loses their ability to, their primary among trees don't work well. Once again, there's five primary among trees, your colon, your kidney, urinary tract, <clears throat> your skin, your lungs, and your brain are the five ways that we eliminate things. They all have to be working efficiently for the body ultimately to get in balance. These people, when they get overwhelmed, Man, this thing is touchy. When they get overwhelmed, <clears throat> they lose the ability to detoxify themselves. So, so what we got now is we got the, the onion, the things, every, every new toxin just puts another layer on the onion. And of course, if they're 28, it's one thing that you don't have as many layers as your onion, but <clears throat> if you're 68, 
you got a few more layers than the onion, and you got to peel them all off. And you, don't, and you can't say, well, I know what the core is. Well, yeah, you may know what the core is, because we know that when you were born, the challenges and stuff, that's your core, but you got a few layers on top. You say, well, let's just treat the core. We can't treat the core yet. You got to get the layer, rid of the layers first before you can go after the core for what's underlying this type of thing. So when these people stop, uh, stop eliminating, they don't do well, uh, obviously, and they will, this, these toxins, and whether you want to call it a mercury, whether you want to call it mold, yeast, Insecticides, pesticides, doesn't matter what it is, it's just another thing that builds up because the body doesn't know what to do with it. And it will put it somewhere and eventually, of course, that tissue will break down because it says, what's this heavy metal doing here? Whatever it is that we're, we're ultimately looking at. So the entire system becomes overwhelmed. This is how people start to develop multiple organ system imbalances. All kinds of problems in multiple systems. Uh, you, where do you start? You have to get their elimination working first. That should be your, no matter what you're treating, for whoever you're treating, for whatever. The, until their elimination systems work, you should not be too aggressive. You're just going to make a person worse uh, by, by treating them that way. So a lot of people, and for the physicians in here, if you mostly treat females, 75% of your patients will be this miasm. Because that's who goes to the doctor. <laughs> for those types of problems. And it's like, okay, so you're, you're, you just accept the fact that they don't eliminate well? They have to do nature's laws more diligent. People who are sore can say, well, I don't have time to do this and that. And they can probably get away with it. These people don't get away with it because they don't have that option because they're not great eliminators in the first place. And of course, what makes these people so much worse are what happens in our medical system whether it's vaccines or antibiotics or steroids or, you know, plus all the other things we get exposed to, <laughs> it becomes a real problem uh, for these people. So they totally overwhelm their systems. You can have physical toxins, but as I said to Laura yesterday, these people almost always have a secret. They have a secret that there may not be, and it may not be terrible, but something they may not be that proud of per se, or they never told anybody about, and it's just because it's something else that they're holding on to, but they really do need to let go of it because it's, it's impeding their body's ability to eliminate something. And that, that's an important component of what we need to be looking at. <clears throat> so we don't want to suppress their information. We want the, to allow the body. So they, of course, they retain water. They retain everything. These are the people who are going to gain weight by drinking, you know, fasting. They're going to gain weight when they fast. It's like they just, because they hold on to everything including water. Uh, unfortunately, they grow lots of things, both benign and malignant tumors, lots of anxiety, lots of fatigue, lots of, they have lots of hormone issues. <clears throat> so here's your typical stressors, birth control pills, cortisone, vaccines, uh, allergy shots, antibiotics, emotions. So these people are the worst people to put on those types of medicines. Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna create all these types of conditions. And I mean, somebody going on, a 12-year-old girl going on birth control pill because her menses, and then one day she says, oh, I have a uterine polyp or I have a colon polyp. It's like, is it related? Of course it's related. It has to be related because that's the way the body has to be able to respond. And that's, that's creating an understanding for what's underlying this thing. Uh, the Loetic Miasm, 11,000 years, goes way back in Africa. Uh, everybody knows about Henry the, Henry the Eighth. You know, kept killing his wives because they wouldn't, because all the babies were still born, because it was him, per se, because it, it's the pure example of syphilis that we learned in medical school. This is all your typical examples of what they experienced. Initially, that was the treatment, it was mercury. So they gave mercury to treat syphilis back in the 17 and 1800s. <clears throat> What's interesting about this one, these problems occur outside the GU organs, psychotic occur inside the GU organs. So it's like the ovarian cyst, it's the, uh, the lesions on the cervix, whereas these lesions, the, the cankers and the, the gummas, are outside on the body, whether it's on a lip or the genital organ or wherever it, it ends up showing. <clears throat> so these people, because they don't eliminate, they just say, well, I'll just, I'll just bust it down, I'll just break the dam down, and so they self-destruct themselves. Uh, these people have a real challenge, unfortunately. Uh, so. These people need a lot of nutritional support. 
because of the fact that they're breaking themselves down all the time, need to constantly be doing antioxidant support, they need a lot of drainage, however you do that in your particular practice, <laughs> what the person ends up doing. Uh, they tend to have a lot more of these unfortunate type of, we'll call them diseases that break down the nervous system. It's pretty serious conditions that, that are underlying that. This is also typically the miasm of, of uh, addiction, whether it's drug addiction, alcohol addiction, sex addiction, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, people tend to kill themselves, uh, not just, once again, not just this miasm, but this is what they tend towards. <laughs> they hate everything. They have violent nightmares about killing vampires and werewolves. Uh, they have a, they're fearful of being killed, so they carry guns. You know, isn't that appropriate in our society? Uh, fears, uh, but does not fear knives. Professions were knives for the hack. So cooks, butchers, and surgeons. It's like, whoa, my surgeon is a little headache. Look out! <laughs> Watch Halloween is coming. <laughs> Cold-blooded cruelty, lack of feelings when committing a crime. Many prisoners. You put that with the... The aspect of what I said, you know, missing the thyroid stage, and you got a bad combination. So they ulcerate, they form lots of ulcers. See, these are the people who get peptic ulcers. They have ulcers on their legs. They have ulcerative colitis. They have autoimmune type problems because the, their body doesn't know how to get rid of things. Well, we just open up the, the, the lining and we'll just bleed if we can. <clears throat> it's typically what happens. You know, the sudden onset of this peptic ulcer. Lots of deformities in the mouth, especially from the inherited aspect of things. Worse at night, bone pain, chronic sinusitis, ulcerations, paradoxical reactions, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Tuberculinic is, as I said earlier, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, lots of people in Europe had tuberculosis. 40% of the populations were exposed to it. <clears throat> and it, was, it, it did cause a shift in immunology because of how the, the body didn't know, how, you know what to do with those types of things. Uh, these type, these ten people tended to have more lung issues. We, that's what we tend to think of to be TB as a lung disease, but of course TB is a systemic illness. can be anywhere in the body. Uh, what's interesting about the lung uh, is the lung is how we communicate with the outside world. So when we communicate with the outside world, what, it, what we breathe out is CO2. And where does the CO2 go? What happens to the CO2? Right, the plants take it up and give what? Oxygen back. That's how we communicate with the outside world. That's what sitting in the forest is all about. You start communicating with nature. You start giving out what they need and they give you back what you need. That's how we communicate. That's why we've got to, that's why I said earlier, get your kids out into nature. Get your grandkids out into the park. Get them to sit on the grass that hopefully hasn't been sprayed with some pesticide. You know, or it's something like that. It's those types of things that ultimately we're looking for to be able to do. So these people don't know how to defend themselves. So tuberculinic people are going to have rampant osteoporosis. These are the people who said, God, I've been taking calcium. I take vitamin D. I do my, all my good stuff. And I said, my bones are still breaking down because they, the bones are the best source of minerals that we have. It's the most ready source. And the body will literally break your own bones down to find the minerals to make the tissues work. So we need to be pretty mindful for these people that minerals, we had talked about antioxidants before, minerals are really important for these people. And whether you add extra electrolytes, act, add trace minerals in addition to eating the 10 different colors of uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, those are the types of things that are particularly important. What's interesting about the tuberculinics, um, they, they tend to be, um, I won't say they're higher, higher spiritual awareness, but they certainly have a, a, a spiritual awareness. It's also the condition of autoimmune disease because their immune system really has gone out to lunch. It doesn't, the body doesn't know how to protect itself uh, when you have this particular miasm, unfortunately. And they don't know how to identify self from non-self. And so if you have a child that's born with this, and you start sticking vaccines in, and then they get an ear infection, you give them an antibiotic, and they're not breastfed, and they're basically be given grain, you know, rice pablum when they're six months old, and you start lining up all the pictures, and their body says, I don't know what any of this is. 
I don't know what to do with any of this. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. Maybe I just react against it. So now I react to everything. So now here's what somebody said earlier. The kid they reacted to everything. They're going to react to everything because the body doesn't know what it should or shouldn't be reacting to. Unfortunately, they're destined to become uh, autoimmune with a variety of different types of autoimmune type problems. Every one of these miasms can have fatigue. This one is particularly fatigued. They just are totally wiped out. When, when tuberculinism is on its rise, your, your endocrine system is being recruited and being depleted. These people will come rapidly become hypothyroid. So their thyroid gets whacked out really early. Uh, and of course, the, what happens in those first few years becomes really critical uh, for these particular people. <clears throat> Ever-changing symptoms. This is, the, this is the patient who comes in and every time they come in, they have a new chief complaint. Well, last time it was headaches and now it's, now it's bowel stuff and now I can't eat anything and now I can't sleep. And it's like, my God, it's like I'm, I'm chasing them around, which is what happens with, uh, unfortunately, these types of patients. <clears throat> Uh, the, the, the only thing I want to say about the cancer miasm, uh, you know, unfortunately I've treated too many of these kids with cancer and I said, why does, like, how does the, how does an 11 month old get cancer? It's like, where the hell did that come from? It's like they haven't been around long enough to accumulate all this stuff. You know, my belief is cancer is a 20 to 30 to 40 year process that happens over time. Well, obviously an 11 month old didn't have that time. So it's transgenerational. You know, I hate to say it, but I think sometimes cancer in kids is to teach the parents something. Is, and you know, I've had some who've done really well and unfortunately I've had some can young cancer patients who've died at two and three years old. Uh, so there's, there's that story to be told in here, uh, something about that, uh, that aspect. The interesting thing about the cancer miasm is with cancer cells, and if you look at what cancer cells are, cancer, the, the challenge with a cancer cell is it goes to the beat of its own drum. It doesn't listen to anybody. It's not listening to the immune system. It's not listening to anybody. So it just goes down this same line. It just keeps dividing. And it's like it doesn't care what anybody else is doing. T pushes the rest of the community out. I mean, the organs work supposed to work together. Cancer cells don't want to work with anybody <coughs> uh, generally. And that's, what, that's, what the, that's the personality of these people. They don't want to be around anybody. They don't want to do anything. They just want to go to the beat of their own drum uh, for what's going on. <coughs> so that's miasm. Um, this is one of the many books. There's dozens of them. The only reason I put this one up is because in the middle of the book, there's an 18 question, um, 18 question questionnaire uh, that I would encourage you to, even if you find it on Amazon or in the library, but don't answer the questions yourself. Have your partner answer the questions. Because what you think you are, because basically what it's going to do, it's going to lay out questions relating to the four different types of temperaments. So you're going to answer and say, well, I like that one. It's not about what you like. What do you really, what are you really like, per se? That's why somebody else answering the questions will probably be more honest. And it will at least put you in the ballpark as to which of these temperaments you potentially are. There are these four temperaments uh, you know, <laughs> that these little pictures show about. I like this cartoon down here. Uh, you may not believe this, but even though we're Siamese twins, our personalities are quite different. <laughs> so, you know, different people fall into different temperaments. That's who they are. And it's ba it was based on their temperament of why they become that. And it go dates all the way back to Hippocrates, 2400 BC, or 400 BC, I mean. 400 years later, Galen, who technically should be the father of uh, medicine because he was an allopath. His therapies were to do opposite medicine. He believed if you had fever, you should take it down. If you had diarrhea, you should stop it. Uh, Hippocrates was truly, sort of, I'll say the naturopathic, because he said, no, if you have diarrhea, don't stop it. If you have fever, don't stop it. Follow nature, eat food as your best medicine, etc. But Galen was totally the opposite. But supposedly, I think in medical school, they still say the Hippocratic Oath, they sh but they should really be saying the Galen Oath. Because really, Galen is more of an allopath than certainly a party. And then at Steiner, some of you may have read, if you really have trouble with insomnia, get Steiner's book. You'll no, have no trouble falling asleep. You'll read one line, say, what the hell was that? You read it again, say, what the hell was that? And by the third time you read it, say, I'm out. 
It is the best book for insomnia because, I mean, I gave up reading Steiner because I, I, like, it took me a zillion years to read the chapter because it's like, I have to read it 90 times. I don't get, what the hell is he saying? <laughs> So Bott wrote a book on nutrition, who's also an anthroposophist. He's, it's, he's a lot easier to understand, that type of, that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then Guineau basically took it a little bit farther, the whole idea of looking at, you know, the different types of temperaments for what it is that we're looking at. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is a lot more about your day-to-day -day stuff. So think of the temperament of what you decide to do on a day-to-day -day is pretty much guided by your temperament. How your body responds to something foreign to you is your miasm. That's how I tend to think about them differently, to put it on the simplest terms uh, for what it is that we're looking at. So the, you know, the, the idea that you know, the temperament may be solely a psychological, but the reality is it has a huge impact on our physical condition. You know, as this example says, if one has a fight with their wife, may contribute to exacerbating their headache, reflux, uh, GERD, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a component that is related to all these types of things. Most people just say, oh, I'm stressed. How you react to the stress is determined by your temperament. And of course, then you have all the physiologic effects that ultimately comes with that type of thing. So according to that book that I just showed you by Randy Rolfe, who interestingly was a lawyer and then decided to get into this. So you have a unique balance of the four. There's the, all four. And when you do the questionnaire, you won't be a perfect one. One will be more than the others, but you're probably going to be a bit of a combination. That's because your system isn't in balance. When the system is in balance, it's pretty clear uh, which one you become. <clears throat> so chronic problems need support of all the humors. Uh, the dominant humor may be depleted, and it usually is in chronic disease, which is what we'll get to. Now, I said earlier, when you're in balance, the best diet that you're going to eat is going to be your temperament diet. It's going to tell you, I do well when I eat these foods. Not because somebody says I have a food sensitivity or a food allergy, because when you're in balance, you won't have any food allergies. The body will be totally in balance. It, it'll tell you what you need to eat, and it says, if I eat that, I don't feel well. So you won't have to need anybody to test you. You'll know exactly that it doesn't feel well. It truly is at the root of a lot of illnesses, uh, these types of things. <clears throat> you know, these are the four temperaments, you know, hot, cold, damp, dry. So the goal is not to, you know, teach you a set. I basically teach this over an entire two days. So this is just a quick, you know, most people read these and say, well, which one would I like to be? Would I, would I like to be this moody, anxious, rigid, sober, pessimistic, reserved, unsociable, quiet person? Oh, I'm not that. That's why you can't answer this questionnaire because if you see that, said, there's no way I'm going to be melancholic because it means I'm a jerk. <laughs> you know? Everybody says, oh, I want to be sociable, outgoing, talkative, responsive, easygoing, lively. That's, oh, that's me. Because <laughs> that's a nice person. But that's not the way it works. <laughs> you know? You're, you're, you're in here somewhere. Are you calm, even tempered, reliable, controlled, peaceful, thoughtful, carefree, and passive? You're more phlegmatic. Are you touchy, restless, aggressive, excitable, changeable, impulsive, and optimistic? You're more choleric. So depending on what you are determines a lot of the components that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the sanguines are, tend to be, as I just said, sociable and extroverted. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all these because, you know, that's not the idea. The idea is, is to introduce that some of the reasons that our patients are like they are is because of who they are. That is a, pre, that is a predetermined component of what they came into the world with uh, in general. <clears throat> So they're good at sales and marketing, but often can get so, in, get so into their work, forgetting uh, working from their heart that they don't feel that their time to need to make money. <laughs> the lymphatics are, are slower types. They tend to have water retention. You know, they, they get into this growth thing. Uh, they speak, uh, this speaks to the ease with which they communicate with others and expand their environment. <laughs> when, however, they're in balance, they tend towards venous congestion and lymph congestion because they tend to hold on to water in general. <laughs> uh, the melancholics, which melancholy is, you know, com is the, what comes from that, tends to be this, these nervous types in general. We tend to think of being melancholic as being sad and depressed. They're usually thin, tend to focus on accounting and things rather than relationships. <clears throat> uh, analytical, which is why they make good accountants, good researchers, technicians, and computer programmers. They like to be by themselves. 
They do best work by themselves in, in general. <laughs> uh, the clerics are the, you know, the liver, the bilious type people. They're organized. They're quite good at managing their lives, jobs, and households uh, in general. Uh, they have a strong relationship with their liver, and then they are just subject to more liver pathology um, underlying this. This is this, you know, the un, I don't know. And for some of you, and, and you mentioned herbs earlier, but I, unfortunately, the way herbs are being taught, at least in more presently, the schools that I'm familiar with, nothing is paying attention to the to the temperament of the plant. Where is the plant growing? So, you know, those of you who practice herbal medicine know that things like echinacea and golden seal and myrrh and that kind of thing are great for, for a throat infection, for sore throat, strep throat. But you give it to 10 people and, you know, a few of them will get great. It's like they one dose and then, I got it. Some people, they take three, four bottles and I say, it's still not there because you're giving the, those herbs to the wrong temperament. If you give it to the wrong temperament, they don't work. So, and you know, using the doctrine of signatures of where the medicines grow, et cetera, that's why I'm not a huge fan of, of so-called patented formulas, which a lot of the supplement companies want to do. It said, oh, this is a sore throat formula. This is a lung formula. If it doesn't fit the temperament, it's gonna do squat. So some people say, oh my God, that was the best thing you've ever given me. So I did that and it didn't do anything. And you'll hear that from patients. And when you know that, you just know that whatever they were given didn't really fit their temperament. There is an overlap between miasm and temperament, as that one suggests. <clears throat> so we have these four humors. Uh, the temperament takes its character from the humor and dominates when a stress causes their energy. So the idea is, is that when are you going to exercise? What food are you going to choose? Who are you going to, who are you going to get uh, in a relationship with, married to, etc.? Uh, are all, it's a, it's a predetermined component of your innate humor. We already know that. <clears throat> so when, when somebody is like this and suddenly, suddenly they're like this, it's like, whoa, there's been a big change. Something has happened to them. And what's happened is they've gone out of balance as far as their temperament is concerned. Uh, that's underlying that. <clears throat> so, as I said, lifestyle tastes and preferences can be altered, adjusted, and evolved. You can't change your miasm, but you can balance your temperament by what you do by your lifestyle. So the foods that you choose, the type of exercise you do, when you exercise, when you go to bed, et cetera, et cetera. You can alter those things and you can more e easily balance this and you, then you can change your, your underlying miasm. Because we have these imbalanced temperaments that are responsible for lots of our presentation that our symptoms have. You know, you mentioned that you got your, on your road, you got really upset and frustrated out of hell with all this, I'm not doing this anymore. I mean, you move out of your temperament and you literally your attitude changes because you've changed temperaments of you know what understandable of those types of things. <clears throat> so the Chinese medicine, <coughs> the air element is listed uh, uh, correspond with the sanguine temperament. They can gain weight easily, but are rarely obese. When they get tired, they will go for sugar to stimulate the thyroid because these these are definitely interrelated how they, and so here is the best diet for somebody who is sanguine. And when they're in balance, this is exactly what they tell you they eat. Because this is when they feel, it says, when I eat like this, I feel great. And that's because, that's a predetermined, that's predetermined bef before you were born. What is the best diet for you based on your temperament? <clears throat> uh, the cholerics are more related to the sun. <clears throat> this is the type of food that they should eat. This is when they feel the best, eating these types of foods. And once again, in order to get here, you gotta peel off all the layers of the onion. Then when, and so when somebody asks, well, what's my temperament diet? I said, we don't need to worry about your temperament diet yet. Because as you peel off the layers of the onion and get closer to the core, they start to realize the foods that make them feel the best. And when you get close to the core, they're going to tell you exactly what they're eating, and then you'll read and say, oh, that's exactly what their temperament diet is. Because they'll, they create this understanding of where they need to be and what they should be. Uh, the melancholics are more of the earth element, <coughs> and that tends to be more their diet preferences and their sleep preferences, uh, generally. <coughs> uh, the water element is the phlegmatic, because they tend to have water retention. 
uh, that type of thing. These are the people who basically should have more protein at breakfast. <clears throat> Daily salads with lots of veggies, uh, no milk or cheese, etc. So there are certain disease tendencies. So these people, because it's the air element, is about oxygen. So they have those types of problems. <clears throat> these people basically are the smoldering fires. They don't get sick very often. Uh, and if they ignore it, they're basically going to uh, use their adrenal glands to power through, which is not what we want people to do. The melancholics are prone to the acute diseases, constipation, diarrhea, etc. <clears throat> the uh, phlegmatics are slow, chronic conditions of chronic otitis media, fatigue, etc., which said, well, that sounds like all of them. But they're all quite unique uh, to getting these people better. And so when you heal the temperament, the, the whole idea is the phlegmatics are cold and wet, so they love those types of foods. The sanguines are hot and wet, they love those types of foods. The cholerics are hot and dry, they love those. Melancholics are cold and they love those. So when somebody's acutely ill, you basically feed the dominant humor, whatever their humor is. So when somebody is a sanguine temperament and they acute illness, that's what you have them do. That's the plan. That's their treatment plan. And <clears throat> when somebody you know, is, is chronic, we usually do the opposite temperament, which in this case would, be, would tend to be more of a, towards the melancholic aspect of things. <clears throat> so they prefer, uh, you shouldn't be doing chronically, avoiding hot long showers, but they should do a dry sauna. And so it, so it'd be with each of these types of temperaments. Once again, if you are interested in that, I encourage you to read the book. Do the questionnaire. And it's, it's, this is a very interesting study, and you'll start to see trends in your patient population, depending on the nature of what your practice is, of the types of patients that you start to see. You'll see the overlap with different temperaments. You'll see the overlap with different miasms. Uh, and you'll start to see, oh, this person is purely melancholic. This is, this is their best, the best treatment you can have them do is that. Now what's the best herb? What's the best homeopathic? What's the best nutraceutical? The best thing that they can do is what they can do for themselves. And knowing which, of their, which temperament they are will allow you to be able to do that, <coughs> both from diet and you know, at-home type therapies. <coughs> so I'm just gonna go through those because those, oh, the Constitution. Uh, you know, so we're talking about George Washington here, of course. It's all about the Constitution. So the, uh, you know, once again, this is a word that sort of has come from classical homeopathy. Um, I don't uh, use that, this term very often because for myself personally, this is really how I prescribe most homeopathics. Uh, it's more based on what's the patient presenting with today. I don't worry about the constitutional remedy because I think of the constitution as being at the core with all the layers of onion on top. <clears throat> and if you, depending who you study with, and classical homeopaths tend to think that this is pretty uh, out there and doesn't make any sense. But, you know, Dr. Gano is my a mentor, was a classical homeopath, and he said, don't do this because you'll never find the remedy anyway. Uh, <coughs> so treat this. <coughs> so basically, if somebody has a GI problem, you open Borky, read the GI section, oh, that fits, that's the remedy, because then a month later, it's a different remedy anyway. Because we're, we're constantly going to be peeling down through the different layers. So most of the remedies I prescribe are based on the, uh, you know, this one. And of course, in cancer, it's based on the nature of the type of cancer. So two and three, or three and four, I mean, are probably the two most common ways that uh, ultimately I will do that. <clears throat> so the functional habits of the body are determined by genetic, biochemical, psychological endowments of the individual, and then they're modified by our environment, which is our temperament, uh, that, that's sort of underlying that. So all these, rings, the, all these three things ultimately tie together. So the, from a homeopathic perspective, a tr the true constitutional remedy corresponds to everything. Their chronic remedy, what's happening to them today, but more and more people, we're not seeing that because we have too many layers on top of their, um, you know, of, of their onion. So, you know, some people believe it's always the same. It's like, and so the always the same is, are those, seven, those are the seven remedies. Uh, Luke de Schepper is a homeopath who now lives in uh, New Mexico. He actually is from Belgium. And if any of you ever study with him or with Robin Murphy, they have the same seven constitutional remedies. And you'll note that they're all minerals with the exception of like a podium, which is club moss, which is a plant per se. So in other words, our, our 
solid core is a mineral. And what I have found is that when I treat somebody for a period of time, these remedies, if you know anything about Materia Medica and homeopathy, those remedies become so clear. It's as if you just read the Materia Medica. It's like they wrote it. It's like, yeah, they have that symptom. Yeah, they have that one. Yeah, they have that one. Yeah, this is how they are. Yeah, that's how they are. So when we get to the point of giving those, we give it once, maybe, or so, and then maybe six months later, and maybe once a year is a tune-up. That's how I, I personally do when I get to the constitutional prescribing uh, over time. It's, it's actually worked well. <clears throat> and I mentioned those seven remedies fit really well into these nine doors as uh, Dr. Gino described them uh, over time. <clears throat> so the summary is for any patient, you start at the top layer and you peel it off. And you peel it off at this rate of speed with which they're able to tolerate it. And when you understand how they eliminate, depending on their miasm, why they p choose to do certain things based on their temperament, and the, uh, the core ultimately will be their constitution. So the goal is we balance this, we balance that, we find this remedy, and you will have a person who will stay in balance forever. Now that's, that's a long process to be able to get somebody there, but once they're there, doesn't matter what their condition was, you truly will have cure. You will have cured somebody of whatever their underlying problem is. Are you finding that more people are becoming more tuberculinic and syphilitic as opposed to historic and psychotic? Like, do you feel like because there's so many toxins on the planet that the population is going down and you're finding more in those four limited? The question was, are more and more people becoming more in the lower ones of the tuberculinic cancer? Yes, because the parents, remember, you inherit this stuff. And so the parents, I don't have it in this presentation, but I have a slide that shows from grandparents what they inherit. And, and if the parents were to do something about it, you'll actually shift back to what the original was. <clears throat> and they won't keep passing it on to their kids. But unfortunately, what's happening with the parents is they're perpetuating it. So a parent who can acquire tuberculin, even if they don't come in with the inherited tuberculin, if they can acquire that based on their lifestyle, that's now what they're passing on. So they get, it truly gets passed down from generation. And um, if you look at, um, wasn't, who wasn't Price? Who was the guy with the uh, Pottinger, the cat studies with Pottinger in the 30s? I mean, it, when he based, so you had the cats who basically were fed processed food and, and cooked milk, and within four generations, all the experiments stopped because they all became infertile, nobody could reproduce, and it took four more generations for him to reverse it, for them to, to go back to the fact that they could basically, you know, stop having all these chronic illnesses. And we are by far more than four generations into changing our food process and all that kind of thing. So the Pottinger cat studies done in the 30s are quite telling about what's happened in sort of modern society. And that's the same thing that's happening here. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions? OK, now we're are we going to take another break. Where is? Uh... Yes. OK. All right. Finally. Woo. <laughs>